After final cleaning of the main housing, we can install the pinion pilot bearing. The pilot bearing goes down into its recess and we can drive it in with a makeshift driver made from a socket and extension. We want to use a socket or a driver whose OD is slightly smaller than the OD of the pilot bearing. But the driver should also be large enough so that it only contacts the bearing from this surface. If you contact the bearing from the inner surface, you'll damage the bearing. Once the bearing is in place, we'll have to install the retaining lock. The retaining lock goes in this direction with the teeth facing back toward you. Your driver should only contact it on this area of the retaining ring. In our case, the same driver we made up for the bearing can also be used for driving the retainer. If you notice, it will not contact the tooth edge, but it does contact that raised ring in the center. Before installing the bearing, we want to lubricate the, the housing with some oil so that the bearing will drive it smoothly. We're going to put the bearing into its housing and it'll go in about a little less than halfway before it actually registers in its seat. We install the driver and center it on top and we gently drive the bearing in place until it's all the way seated in the bottom of the bore. As before, when the sound changes, the bearing should be seated all the way in its bore. Now we can install the retainer. Just place the retainer the proper direction in the bore. Install the driver on top of the retainer and gently tap it into place. Okay. That completes installing the pilot bearing and the bearing retainer. Now we can install the pinion carrier and the ring gear carrier. With the pilot bearing installed, the next step is to take a preliminary pinion depth reading. To do that, I suggest starting with a 15,000 shim. Then we're going to install the pinion assembly without the O-ring at this time. We'll use at least three bolts to secure the pinion housing to the main housing, pull them up hand tight, and check for pinion depth. If pinion depth is correct, we can proceed by installing the ring gear, setting backlash, and checking pattern. If the pinion depth is not correct, we need to install the proper shim to make the depth correct. We've installed the 15,000s pinion shim to get our initial pinion depth reading. Keep in mind that earlier we determined that our parting line is actually four thousandths further back from our actual axle center line. That means when we take our micrometer reading from the parting line to the back of the pinion, we need to subtract four thousandths from our actual micrometer reading to establish our pinion depth. Our pinion is supposed to be set at one inch twenty-five thousandths depth from actual axle center line. This means that if we have a reading of 129 thousandths, our pinion is correctly set at depth because we have to add four thousandths for the discrepancy in our main housing. Let's take a reading and see where we are. Currently, we're reading one inch 27 thousandths. This means our pinion is two thousandths too deep in the housing. We have to increase from a 15 to a 17 thousandths pinion shim and recheck our reading. With the 17 thousandths shim in place, our new reading is 1 inch 29 thousandths. Now we can install our ring gear, set backlash, and check pattern. With our correct pinion depth established, we can install the ring gear assembly. We want to first lubricate the adjuster threads in both the housing and the bearing caps. We'll also lubricate our carrier bearings with some white oil. Then we're going to install the carrier with the outer races on into the main housing. With the carrier laid in place and the bearings square in a bore, we can lay our adjusters in. Lay them up along the side of the bearing and down into the thread 
Move them to make sure that they're not binding or cross-threading. Tighten up on the bearings until you have no play and just see about where your backlash is. The backlash is a little loose at this time. So we're going to slide the carrier over using our bearing adjusters. Snug the bearings up again and check. Now we have a nominal backlash. Now we can install the bearing caps and retaining bolts. We have lubricated the bolts with oil. I'm going to put them in the caps and match up our caps left and right from the punch marks we originally used. I'm going to hold the cap back off of the bearing and just get the bolt started. This will align the cap to the threads of the adjuster. The cap should go down to the parting line in the case without binding. If it does bind, you're cross-threaded on the adjusting nut and reset the cap until it goes down flush without any effort. Then we snug up our bolt, install the other cap. At this time, we just want to snug the cap bolts with a wrench. And using a spanner wrench or equivalent, just make sure that our adjusters turn freely. This will ensure that we haven't cross-threaded the adjusters. Next, we'll torque the cap bolt to 50% of the required torque. In this application, that would be 40 pounds. With the bearing caps of 50% torque, we now want to set our carrier bearing preload. A good way of doing this without specialized equipment is to remove the pinion, adjust our preload on the bearings, reinstall the pinion, and then set our final backlash and check our pattern while maintaining bearing preload. With the pinion assembly removed, we can now just spin the ring gear. We only brought our bearings up finger tight, and as you can see, the gear is very free to spin. If you have used bearings, you're going to bring it up to zero lash and then just snug them a very little. We have new bearings. We actually want to set a little bit of drag on the bearings like we did in the pinion. To do that, we're going to work from one side. If we look at the adjuster on this side, we've lined up one of the lock holes with the lock plate retaining area. Let's go to the opposite side, and we're going to tighten up on our bearing while we spin the ring gear. If you noticed before, the ring gear spins very freely. As we continue to spin the ring gear and tighten up on the bearing, you notice that it doesn't want to spin quite as long when you release it. That means you've established a zero lash. Continuing with that, we want to bring our adjuster up until the next lock lug is lined up into the lock bolt down area. This gives us correct preload on our bearings. If you notice, I'm spinning the gear. It still spins after I release it, but for a very short time. We'll now reinstall the pinion carrier, check our backlash, and move the pinion either left or right until we have correct lash. We do that by moving the adjusters either one way or the other. By moving both adjusters the same amount, we will retain the amount of preload as we set backlash. We've reinstalled the pinion assembly, and now we want to set our backlash. We mounted our dial indicator and zeroed it out. And if you recall, while checking backlash, you must make sure that the pinion does not move. So now we're going to move the gear and read our backlash. Right now we have approximately 27,000 backlash. Our directions call for between 8 and 12 thousandths. So we have to shorten the backlash. To do that, we're going to first loosen the adjuster on the far side to give us room to move the gear towards the pinion. And then the same amount that we move the adjuster on the other side will tighten up on the adjuster on the side. That will maintain our previously set carrier bearing preload. We'll continue this until we arrive at our desired backlash. Now we're going to draw this 
adjuster up two notches. This will shift the ring gear closer to the pinion and close up our backlash. Now we'll recheck our backlash again. First we're going to rock the gear against the pinion, zero our indicator, draw it back and read our backlash. We're now at 20, so we just closed up seven thousandths with two increments on the adjusters. We need to move another ten thousandths to get in the specified range. So I'm going to go another two, first backing off this side, and then tightening this side, two more notches. Zero up, and check our backlash. We're at 12 thousandths right now, which is the high end of our adjustment range. Let's go for more around nine, nine to 10 thousandths. For that, we're gonna move our adjusters just a little bit. After a while, you get the feel of it. And we're gonna zero up, and check again. Now we have just about, just a hair under nine thousandths. What we need to do now is torque our four cap screws to the full 80 pounds, double check our backlash, then check the pattern between the ring and pinion gear. If you don't have enough tension on it, when you tighten it up, it changes. You gotta play all over again. We did a final torque on our cap bolts to 80 pounds. We're gonna recheck our backlash. The indicator zeroed. As you can see, now we have just about eight and a half thousandths backlash. We lost about three tenths on backlash just by torquing the cap screws the rest of the way. Your final backlash check should include measuring your backlash at four positions on the ring gear. All four of these readings should not vary more than one thou total. If you have different readings that seem to be higher and lower as you go around the ring gear, this would suggest that the ring gear is either cop on the carrier or the carrier doesn't run true. To determine this, you mount a dial indicator and check the readout against the back side of the ring gear. This is a linear ring gear check. Once again, your readout all the way around should not vary more than one thousandths of an inch. If it does, you must remove the ring gear, check to see if there are any burrs or anything that can be in the way of keeping it mounting flush to the carrier, or replace or machine the carrier to make it true. We're in a desired range, now we need to check our pattern with the checking compound. To check our gear tooth contact pattern, we want to use our checking compound on at least three teeth in succession. We want to just put a nice even coating on the full face of the gear tooth. I'm using Prussian blue as a marking compound. I, I just prefer it over the other types of uh, marking compound, but you can use whichever you, pref you prefer. Now we want to move the ring gear through the pinion. I turn the pinion in rotation, a drive, forward drive rotation, and we actually, we put the compound on the drive side of the ring gear. Also, we'd like to hold a little bit of pressure back on the ring gear, so we have more pressure between the gears, which will get spread the compound, give us a more accurate reading. Okay, here we come. Let's look at our reading. We have a very even, broad contact across the entire face of the tooth. This is a perfect mesh on these gears. We look at the other gears, the other teeth, they're almost the same. They have a little bit less contact in this area. If we run the gear through a few more cycles, this should all even out. You can see now, after running the gears through again, this pattern is actually increased in length, more even matched this one. 
If we run it through another cycle, it'll get even better. This pattern indicates that our pinion depth and backlash is correct for this gear set. Next, we're going to show you what the pattern would be like if the pinion depth was either too deep or too shallow. As promised, to show you a comparison between a properly set ring and pinion and improperly set, we move the pinion in three thousandths. So instead of it being at one inch, 25 thousandths, it is now in at one inch, 22 thousandths. We reset our backlash, same as before. And now if you notice, our contact pattern is very high and narrow toward this end of the tooth. Next, we'll move the pinion three thousandths too far away. So it'll be one inch, 28 thousandths, and show you what the difference in just three thousandths being off of the pinion depth can do. With the pinion moved three thousandths too far away from axle center line, and we've reset the backlash, you notice that the pattern now is too high and narrow. This is why it's very important to get your pinion depth set correctly and back up those settings with a visual reference from your marking compound. With proper pattern established, all that's left is to remove the pinion carrier, reinstall it with the seal, the o-ring seal, torque the bolts to 35 pounds, install the carrier bearing adjuster locks with Loctite and torque them 20 pounds. That will complete the assembly of the 9-inch Ford differential. We're installing the O-ring into the pinion carrier in its groove. And to make reassembly easier, you want to put a light film of grease on the O-ring to lubricate it so it'll slide back into the main housing. Okay, now we reinstall it. Put the housing in until the O-ring contacts, and then just start your bolts in place to hold it for you. You can then draw the pinion carrier into place by alternately going across, moving it across with the bolts until the housing is seated, and then torque all bolts to 35 pounds. Just like when we use the bolts to draw the ring gear on, you want to go evenly. And this should take very, very little effort to draw the unit together. Just keep on going across so you, nothing gets cocked or binds up. Once you've seated all the bolts, you should torque them to 35 foot-pounds. The final operation is to install the adjusting nut locks. These will want to lock tight because we don't want them to come loose and fall inside the housing. And all we need to do is loop the lock in place. and torque the bolt to 20 foot-pounds. That completes the reassembly of this differential.